actually, um, Luis, um, I want to share my screen real quick. I just want to um, give one update. Um, I sent an email, I think it was last week, about MPOX. Um, just to know that um, there was one case. Um, am I sharing my screen? Can you see this? Um, there was one case that was diagnosed at Howard County Hospital, um, an inpatient. And then, you know, there is this sort of, um, you know, evidence of uh, maybe a slight increase happening. We know for sure that the clay 2 MPOX, um, which is mainly sexually associated, does continue to be transmitted around seven cases a day diagnosed nationally. Um, so certainly not at the level that we were at before. Um, but just to keep it on your radar, because it is still around um, for people who um, are at risk, and you know this would include people who are at risk for sexually transmitted infections if they have not had um, an MPOX illness or diagnosis, and if they have not previously completed full vaccination, then um, please discuss um, vaccination with your patients. In particular, we know that people living with HIV who have poorly controlled HIV have had the most serious outcomes and death. Um, so um, just, just that update and then included in that update, I mentioned that in the um, Democratic Republic of Congo, there is now this um, outbreak of clade one virus um, that is predominantly seems to be in children. So far, no clade one um, diagnosed here in the U.S. But um, you know, just to be aware, and when they, when there are, when they are testing for MPOX, um, they are checking for clade. I saw that um, we have both. Matthew Hamill, who is the PI for the STOP study. So if you do have somebody who's diagnosed and um, uh, treatment is, uh, you know, a consideration, then um, ideally for Tikavira, Matt, you would reach out about the STOP study because we still really need to understand more about the impact um, of treatment. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Liz Gilliams is here both, you know, wonderful experts in MPOX. I don't know, Matthew and Liz, if you have anything else you want to add. Thanks, Joyce. I would just say that um, anyone with MPOX, doesn't matter how mild it is, could be, um, can join the stump study and potentially benefit from treatment. Okay, great. So, um, you know, something something that we are definitely keeping keeping on our radar. Um, all right. So, or you, or I'm sorry, Luis, if you want to share your screen again. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Super. Uh, all right, so I'm uh, just going to introduce um, both um, Dr. Shaw and Dr. Um, Gonzalez Coro, um, uh, who have been working with me on this HIV primary care gaps. Um, Dr. Shaw is a MedPeds resident, urban health resident, who is in his last year of residency and about to go to University of Illinois um, to join faculty there um, in general internal medicine. He's um, rotated with me this year in the Bartlett practice as one of his um, uh, main clinic uh, rotations and just really such a joy to work with. Um, and uh, 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 has, has done a wonderful job both in the clinic and with this project. And then Dr. Gonzalez Coro 
I think um, many or most of you do know um, one of our fabulous infectious diseases fellows who um, has been also working with me on this as part of a quality improvement project as part of his ID fellowship. So um, I'm going to leave it. And, and Dr. Uh, Gonzalez Coro is finishing his fellowship here. And um, in the process of, um... I already got a job. I'm gonna be starting hey. Bellevue NYU next uh, this hey. August. Wow! Congratulations. Okay. Um, so to both of them, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Yay! Um, for their um, you know, endeavoring on the next next phase of of their careers. So um. Without further ado, I'm just going to turn it over to them um, to, to present this project. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, can everybody see the, the slide? OK. So we have no conflict of, of interest. Um, in this slide, I'd like to introduce you. Thank you for providing us with this space. Um, as we were introduced, uh, this uh, has been a work uh, in mentorship by Dr. Jones. Um, we have working on this quality improvement project uh, we're calling the HIV primary care gaps. This is a project led uh, by Dr. Jones, as I mentioned. And currently, um, I wanted to expose that our electronic medical record uses the TAPS called care gaps to remind providers how to identify care gaps related to primary care. However, today there has not been an adaptation of this tool to the um, directed to HIV specific primary care, including screening, vaccination, and general care recommendations for people living with HIV. Uh, we propose these quality improvement projects to address and provide evidence-based guidelines for HIV primary care to assist providers in caring people, uh, uh, in caring for people living with HIV and to prevent these care gaps uh, in their care. Uh, as a general objective, objectives of this presentation, we would like to describe our quality improvement pilot project, leveraging the EMR to address HIV-specific primary care gaps, uh, as well as quarterly studies, the current guidelines, and proposed primary care recommendations for people living with HIV who appear in EPIC. As well, we would like uh, to take this space to provide um, for for you to provide us with further feedbacks on care gaps while balancing. Uh, alarm, fatigue, and realistic implementation of this project. Uh, as a background, over the past several decades, as we all know, HIV has transitioned from uh, to a treatable chronic illness. Um, its care similarly has transitioned and increasingly managed by primary care physicians. As a result, many people living with HIV now receive disease-specific care in a primary care setting on the loo of an infectious disease specialist. As a result, uh, on this shift, there's a growing need to, um, for better resources to equip primary care physicians with best practices in HIV management. These resources will be helpful to the entire care team, including nurses, social workers, and any other, uh, as doctors, and any other healthcare related staff. Uh, to have a visual access to identify potential HIV-related care gaps to ensure that they are addressed. These re resources also will allow for more teamwork. Um, currently, in our electronic medical records, uh, uses care gaps for general primary care, as we mentioned, but we don't have a specific one for uh, HIV uh, advisory and care gaps, including a screening, vac vaccination, and general care. We propose these quality improvement projects to assist providers uh, in, in this task. Currently, there's no much literature about the potential positive benefit of the use of this tool. A, a recent abstract, as you can see in this slide, was published in December of 2021 by Dr. Fukada uh, et al. at Baylor College of Medicine, exploring the use of epic gaps and smart phrases as potential tool to improve health maintenance in patients living with HIV. As you can see, uh, this is how we appear in this chart. And many of you might be familiar already with this uh, tab. Uh, this study was a chart review of 100 patients after implementation compared to 62 prior to implementation to have improved rates of 
and, and the statistical, they found a statistical significant uh, on improved rates of hepatitis A vaccination, Hep B vaccination, and flu vaccination. Pneumonia vaccine and anal pap smear were both suboptimal, uh, but providers did report that the time that they spent searching for labs results and immunization records and documents uh, and documentation were uh, shortened. Uh, of course, uh, this will be based on, on evidence, and we will be using uh, federal uh, approved guidelines, including the HIV. Uh, we 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 have used to to uh, this develop this project the federally approved clinical guidelines of HIV, the CDC uh, uh, clinical guidelines, and the uh, Infectious Disease Society of America clinical practice guidelines. Uh, given the constraints of time, we're not going to go to every single lab, um, and we will uh, 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 at the end explain that we will be proposing a survey where all providers will be able to see which ones are the gaps that we are proposing and obtain further feedback. These are metrics that we have identified. Some of them are more uh, explicit, but we wanted to go through one of the less explicit that have some nuances to their implementation, uh, and that will be explained by Dr. Shah. Dr. Shah, you can take over. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Luis. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. Um, so like Luis mentioned, we have been exploring many, many care gaps uh, in primary care for patients who are living with HIV. But we wanted to take this time with all of the expertise that's in the room to specifically talk about a few. And I want to emphasize that we want to make this a very inter interactive uh, session. We do want to spend this time hearing your feedback on what we have proposed and your thoughts with the main points in mind of will this lead to alarm fatigue uh, for providers who are you know, working very hard taking great care of our patients who are living with HIV. So for the, over the next few slides, we'll, we're picking out a few of those specific care gaps. Um, and so for the first one, just to kind of explain the guideline and what we have proposed in our uh, system. So we have MMR. Uh, so um, the guidelines from the IDSA, as well as the HIV uh, clinical info guidelines, uh, recommend that all patients who are living with HIV who are born after 1957 have documented immunity with MMR IgG positivity. Uh, currently, this does not exist as a, a care gap in our system, uh, but our proposed metric is that all patients who are in our Bartlett Clinic who are born after 1957 have a MMR IgG positive. And so if they are missing that, <clears throat> under the tab in care gaps, we would see MMR IgG as a flag that, that would show up. Uh, in conjunction with MMR, often comes varicella as those are childhood vaccines. Um, and the guidelines that are recommended for varicella are to check vaccination status or uh, IgG for all patients who are living with HIV who are born after 1980 and have a CD4 count that is over 200, as well as a CD4 percentage uh, over 15%. And there are some uh, clear uh, indications for what is empiric uh, immunity to uh, VZV. And uh, these are the, the um, these recommendations were confirmed by the IDSA guidelines as well as our own uh, Hopkins expert, uh, Dr. Durbin. Uh, so our proposed metric for varicella was that all patients who are born after 1980 either have documented vaccines in the medical record or have uh, a VZV IgG positivity uh, in, their, um, in their chart. So I wanted to open up to feedback from our providers. Um, if you were to see the two, uh, two possible care gaps show up on the bottom left-hand side of your screen for a patient, uh, uh, prompting you to order MMR IgG and titers or VZV titers, would this uh, be a source of possible alarm fatigue, uh, something that, that you would utilize, or would it be something that you find yourself likely to ignore or find frustrating? I'm seeing from Dr. Gil, uh, Gilliams that, that, that they would use this. Uh, 
This is Sarah Reeves. I'm a nurse practitioner. I think um, it's challenging when people get healthcare in a wide variety of locations. And so information that might exist, even an electronic medical record in another place in the EMR, like to be able to get rid of this alert automatically if it's been done is, is a challenge. I, I'm in the county program, so I'm in a lot of different locations. Labs come in a lot of different ways. And so trying to get rid of alerts is, is sometimes challenging, um, even if I know that something's been done. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'm sorry. I know that Luis, you and Reveal are running the show. Could I ask a question Absolutely. of the group? I, I'm just curious, do you, the current care gaps that exist, right? So that's sort of in the, in the bottom left, um, you know, as um, Reveal and Luis mentioned, this exists in Epic for um, people without HIV, um, and then, you know, this sort of denominator of who is eligible for different metrics varies, right? Depending on age, some are disease specific like diabetes, where you just get these cues about um, what uh, kind of a screening or um, immunization or, you um, you know that that they that they should have had. Do you do you all feel just comfortable talking about a little bit about that in general? People who maybe, if you feel comfortable, raise your hand if you use it. I'm gonna raise my hand because <laughs> this this will then help lead to you know. Um, if we're adding more things on, uh, you know, is this something that's ignored? Again, I know that we're all really busy, but the idea is, you know, that this is supposed to be a support for us. And like uh, Luis and Erviel said, like for the team, you know, we can build some of these things into the workflow, like with MAs and nurses. Okay, so Liz and I... <laughs> Yeah, I can say um, I find uh, the care apps relatively useful and uh, try to like it like as a second check for me to be like, have I done all these things? I find them helpful, but sometimes like, especially like the BMI care app, I find like a little bit hard to like remember how to like complete and check off the list. Yeah. I feel like a vaccination is very easy to either, you know, address and complete the issue but other ones like the BMI, I'm still kind of like, I may have done the work, but not like documented the right thing that makes it go away. <laughs> right, right. And I believe that, that we can also, uh, our plan is to submit these to an EPIC, uh, to the EPIC team and that we can even say, uh, ask them to, to implement a feature where you hover over the care gap and then it'll automatically just let you order exactly what you need with just one click. So hopefully yeah. that also helps with that. Um, to, as well. to, uh, to add to the concern for other EMRs and how to collect different data, this also would allow you to, uh, once you do your chart review and identify uh, prior labs or vaccinations in your patient, you can also update uh, this wh whatever section you have identified as complete and, um, and it will collect more precise data into our system. And I, I just want to make another comment for us sort of old school, more clinic people with our, um, you know, paper forms that we would complete and we would, you know, and some of you may still do that, but, you know, where you're putting the date and we had um, CD4 viral load ART. At the top, we did have, in a way, you know, some primary care things um, or, or or things that were crucial for people living with HIV that we we did track, you know, in the written form. Um, and so this is, and, and like having a blank for that year was sort of a cue, oh, I need to um, make sure that, uh, you know, they, they get, I, I check the lipids or that I, you know, those kinds of things, so. This is an attempt to um, bring that into the into the EMR. Okay. 
Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so yes, Sarah, uh, to uh, th thank you for your comment. I I'm hopeful that, that in addition to these care gaps, we can uh, implement a system that helps us fulfill the exact documentation that's required as a part of this project as well. Uh, Luis, we can move on to the next uh, to the next slide. Uh, so as part of the uh, care gaps as well, especially for patients who are living with HIV, as you all know, uh, many of them are dependent on sex behaviors of our patients. And this is a challenging, uh, challenging piece of the history to document for us providers. And we will discuss that a little bit in, uh, in a few slides. Um, but we wanted to talk specifically about a few of these uh, sex behaviors. Uh, and this slide will focus on two of our four. Uh, so the first one that we wanted to talk about was uh, syphilis uh, screening. So um, per the IDSA guidelines, uh, it is recommended for at least annual screening of uh, patients who are living with HIV uh, if they are asymptomatic and also recommends increasing the frequency to every three to six months if they're considered a high risk. Uh, I also understand from our conversations with Dr. Jones that as part of Bartlett's Ryan White uh, reporting that syphilis screening is also required uh, for, for that purpose of our clinic as well. So our proposed metric is to have syphilis screening a uh, flag to have at least happened every year for all patients who are living with uh, HIV. And then the challenge with this, as I mentioned, is the sex practice documentation. Um, and uh, in a few slides, uh, we will open up a question of, of how exactly we uh, document sex practices. Um, the other care gap uh, on this slide that we wanted to talk about is anal pap smear. Um, before we move on to that, I did want to ask if, uh, for the providers, if having the syphilis uh, screening flag uh, would be helpful for you guys as well, given that, that it is also part of our um, part of our Ryan White reporting and is recommended in the guidelines. I'm gonna make one other commentary. Go ahead. You, you, you know, our requirement is that we report for Ryan White, you know, whether it was done. And then um, if it was not done, if it was not clinically indicated, or if it was just not done. And so, um, you know, we've, as part of this, um, in order to make sure that we um, get as much credit as possible, you know, we've been sending out to you all, um, if it's not been done, you know, review it and let us know if it was not clinically indicated. So um, with this, there is an opportunity with all of the care gaps, there's always an opportunity to modify the care gap, right? So, um, you know, there would be this opportunity to, you know, have syphilis screening go away um, as a care gap if it was not clinically indicated. Um, so. Uh, Joyce, hi, it's Matthew here. Um, I love the idea of a uh, syphilis um, uh, care gap, and that I mean, and then it's easy to to tick a box and say not not appropriate or a person not sexually active or or whatever the explanation is. Because I, I also really f appreciate the feedback of when you send those forms around because it's 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 um, you know, for somebody who thinks about syphilis a lot, then it's, it's a really good reminder to make sure that I'm up to speed with uh, offering testing to everyone. So I, I think it would be a great thing. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamill. Um, okay, I think we can we can move on to the next, uh, next topic, which is uh, the anal pap smear uh, care gap as well. And as we've learned from the recently published ANCHOR trial, we know that the diagnosing and treating precancerous anal lesions uh, does lead to uh, improvement in outcomes uh, and prevention of anal cancer. Uh, and so we wanted to include that in our care gaps as well. The challenge with this specific one is that at current point, there is no consensus guideline. So we wanted to, to hear from our uh, HIV providers, how are they currently implementing uh, anal pap smear screening and which guidelines are you all using uh, to inform your clinical practice? So in our review, we did find two main guidelines. So one that 
uh, has been around for a little bit of time is the New York State Guideline, uh, which is uh, to perform annual pap smears for all patients who are living with HIV over the age of 35 if they fall into these following categories, uh, many of sex with men, transgender women, and transgender men. And then for all other individuals who don't fall into that category, the recommendation at this point is digital anal rectal exams annually for all patients over 35. And then to, if there are concerning symptoms or uh, concerning exam to then perform the anal pap smear. Uh, the other guideline that was very, very recently published was from the International Anal Neoplasia, anal Neoplasia Society, which uh, looking at uh, demographics and, and incidence rates of uh, anal cancer in different populations that are higher risk, uh, specifically said that for patients uh, who are living with HIV uh, that are uh, MSM populations or transgender women, that annual anal pap smears uh, would be recommended for patients who are over the age of 35, and that for all patients who are living with HIV, including uh, women, including men who have sex with women, all patients uh, living with HIV over the age of 45 should get annual anal pap smear um, screening as well. And so our proposed care, gra care gap was to go with the, um, with the uh, Anal Neoplasia Society guidelines and uh, with those recommendations. So I wanted to open up to our providers, uh, what guidelines do you currently use for anal pap smear? And uh, is this a, a care gap that would be useful to you or would it, uh, would it contribute to alarm fatigue? I'm just showing my face to encourage <laughs> some feedback if you all feel comfortable. Um, hi. So um, to, ans to answer the question, I've been I had been using the uh, the New York uh, guidelines up until I was made aware of the new uh, guidelines. Um, I had a, a conversation with Dr. Abdi um, in GI, and she had um, she had forwarded those to me. So I think you know that that they would be the the most conservative ones, and I think um, most appropriate. So I again uh, would welcome. This is a care gap. Uh, one, a question that I had that I don't know if there is anyone from um, of our uh, GYN uh, colleagues on, but a question that I had was whether when when um, GYN was seeing uh, uh, women for their uh, annual review or for for review whether they were taking an anal pap at that, that time. I don't know if anyone can answer that. I'm I've never been quite sure. I, th I think it's been inconsistent, Matthew. So, so that's something that, um, you know, I've spoken with Jean about and like we've connected GYN with um, Dr. Abdi and Dr. Buckwald um, to help encourage um, that practice. Um, I have had times when, you know, personally, when I know that somebody has a GYN appointment coming up. Um, I um, will request, you know, I'll reach out to whomever they're going to see. Um, but that's definitely something that we can um, revisit with GYN. The other piece is we do now have the ability to do HPV genotyping um, as well with the anal pap, and that is incorporated into the um, International Anal Neoplasia Society guidelines. Um, I've been working on sort of an update of, um, it's been a while since I've sent out the screening guidelines and they were based on New York State and we didn't have HPV genotyping. The HPV genotyping, if there's high risk, that can um, help with decision-making about ASCUS. So just in terms of if somebody has um, ASCUS and then there's high risk um, HPV, that would move you more towards um, doing a referring for HRA. Um, so 
you know, again, just trying to sort of distill that in a way that is easily interpretable. Um, I can also just send out, I should just send out those guidelines anyway, but um, I've been trying to, you know, take it and make it a little bit more digestible for people um, to interpret. Siobhan, I see your hand raised. Yeah. Um, yes. The one thing I wanted to say about was with patients, the female patients now with this guideline for the anal pap, I, I think it would be a good idea for providers that are sending patients to let them know before they're going and why that's necessary. Because I did have a female patient recently say to me during one of our patient groups about that they had told her she had to have an anal pap and also maybe more clear speaking with patients about um, particularly the female patients. Yeah, and you know, we can bring that back to GYN as well, because you know, that that would be a conversation that, you know, anytime before you're gonna do a, a you know, procedure, you know, making sure that um there's like a clear understanding um, from the patient about what it's about and why. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And there are, it's actually also for um, people who are um, immunosuppressed transplant patients as well. I mean, we're focused on HIV right now, but um, our transplant group, um, in particular, Willa has been like super active in this and very interactive with our um, uh GI uh, colleagues um, about about this issue. Thank you so much for all the all the comments and the and the feedback. Um, so um, <clears throat> I think we can move on to our next slide, uh, Louise. So uh, the next one uh, that also depends on sex behavior is uh, STI testing with gonorrhea and chlamydia, uh, as well as with uh, trichomonas. Uh, and so per the IDSA guidelines for gonorrhea and chlamydia, that uh, all patients living with HIV should get checked at least annually if they are asymptomatic and every three to six months if they are high risk, similar to the syphilis screening. Um, and our proposed metric for this would be uh, at least uh, every once every 12 months for patients living with HIV. From our discussions with, with Dr. Jones, historically, it, it seems like there was a, uh, in the past, a best practice advisory for STI testing that, that was absolutely considered a, a nuisance by many providers uh, and ended up getting uh, ignored very frequently. Um, and so we, we especially wanted to hear feedback on gonorrhea chlamydia testing uh, with, of course, the option to then, uh, you know, in that column say that it's not clinically indicated for whatever specific reason similar to above, but just given that, that, that there has previously been expressed some concern about alarm fatigue with specific STI testing, uh, we wanted to, to hear feedback on that as well. And then also discussing trichomonas. Um, in the uh, IDSA and CDC, it seems like there's a slight, uh, a slight difference in recommendation where in the IDSA guidelines, it says annually for all patients who are having vaginal sex, um, or every three to six months, depending on their sex practices, whereas the CDC specific page on trichomonas uh, recommends um, routine annual screening uh, just for asymptomatic women. So uh, our proposed metric for trichomonas specific screening uh, was at least every 12 months for all patients who are living with HIV if they had female uh, sex assigned at birth. And our, our next slide is going to focus on how do we document sex behaviors and how do we document gender identity and sex identity as well. Uh, and so I wanted to ask um, our providers uh, similarly, or sorry, Luis, if we could stay on the on the prior uh, slide for now. Um, I wanted to ask our providers how they would feel about these specific care gaps with gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas, uh, if they would be welcome or if they would be considered uh, contributing to alarm fatigue. Um, I appreciate your patience. I understand a lot of our questions are sounding very similar uh, between the slides, but but definitely wanted to open it up to feedback before we inundate your epic with this. So as one of the responsible parties for the previously uh, not well tolerated sexually transmitted guidelines, uh, epic BPA, uh, it was in good faith, right? It was all done to try to improve the quality of care. And uh, this was Steve Berry's uh, research project to try to improve gonorrhea and chlamydia testing and screening because there were obviously undetected infections. I think what 
hopefully we can do is improve the um, qualifications for this testing um, algorithm to be implemented so that it can register when testing has been done. And I think that was one of the problems. Mm. Um, and there is alarm fatigue because I, you know, pushed through these things myself and was part of the team that helped implement them. Um, that said, I will tell you that we diagnose stuff when people have ordered these tests. And so as annoying as it is, we have had a number of cases, and we just had this on the inpatient service where I recommended screening for a bunch of people, and we found syphilis and gonorrhea and chlamydia and a whole bunch of trick. So um, I appreciate that it's not um, pleasant, but but these testing guidelines are in place for reasons. And so if we can make it appropriate for the specific patients, I'm hoping we can both decrease the uh, amount of sexually transmitted infections circulating through Baltimore and improve our screening rates here in the clinic. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Gibel. And apologies for it being irritating before. We, we, it was all a, a good faith effort. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, Kelly, thank you. Thank you for that, um, that context. And, um, you know, um, that was, that's part of the question, right? So it's, this is here on the side um, on the bottom, it would be the same, it would be similar, right? Where if you, if you don't have, um, people who, um, you know, you think are at risk or they don't indicate they're at risk, it's just always going to be red, right? Um, unless you go in and sort of alter it. Um, so I think, I think the question here is, we, you know, what we're proposing right now, and and I think Luis and Erville are going to go through a way that Kelly, like you said, that we could um, have the appropriate patient population identified. Um, the problem with that is right now we don't have consistent structured data to do that. So what we're proposing is in the interim, how would you all feel about it's just set every 12 months you you sort of see it over there as a as a cap. So will it generate the order automatically? Uh, well, you I still believe have to go that, in and generate the order. The, the way the way that that we're hoping that it can be implemented is that when you hover over the care gap, it'll give you an option to one click order the um, the test that you need. Um, Hopefully, well, we'll see how. I think, the I think let's able. not overpromise. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think um, it would start with you would see it as a gap, but there are uh, if you follow Julie MacArthur um, for your preference list, she um, has the you know the orders we've we put them into categories so. Um, you, if you have, if you then go to that preference list, you could easily find um, the the orders. Uh, Dr. Hamill. Yeah, thank you. Um, jo Joyce can I, and, uh, and others, can I check whether we validated self-collected um, swabs? I think that's a, would be a, a, yeah. a great, a great, bar that's a great barrier to remove. Um, and we, it would just be worth just describing have. that to everyone. Great. We have validated self-collection. The issue is that Medicare um, does not pay for screening more than once for most populations. And so there were a lot of, there's been a lot of testing that's been done that's been not billed. And so um, we're stuck in a, this is for all of our STI screen. They don't want us to implement the self-testing until we figure out giving people this, um, it's called an ABN, where you're like letting people know that they may, this is not covered by their insurance and they may have to pay. So this is, this is the mundane, we're like in the mundane part of healthcare, right? We're talking about Epic, we're talking about care gaps. And then now I'm talking about insurance. So that's where that is right now, Matthew. 
Thank you. Um, yeah. That's really helpful to know. And I would just make a plug for I Want the Kit. I have a, a n- number of patients now who, um, you know, take t- take control, uh, uh, who are auton- autonomous in their own STI testing. Of course, it's not for everyone, but it is available in English and Spanish. And um, you know, it's a great free service. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I definitely have underutilized that myself. So I'll, I'll definitely be using that more. Thank you. Um, so Luis, I think we, we can move on to our next uh, our next slide, which is kind of addressing these, uh, how do we actually categorize risk in EPIC with structured data as, uh, as uh, Dr. Jones had mentioned. Um, so uh, at, at least even in my own practice and, and in many providers practice, we often document uh, sex behavior and pros in our notes. Uh, so uh, mentioning uh, sex partners, number of partners, condom usage, um, uh, but it is a little bit more challenging to actually go into the chart and uh, into uh, the, the first screenshot here is of the history tab where we can indicate that, a pa- you know, the birth control that a patient uses, uh, which partners they have. Um, the other piece to structure data that Epic can uh, use and then pull and then we can use in our care gap is also the sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, often abbreviated as SOGI, uh, that can help us understand our patients' uh, sexual orientations, their gender identity, and their sex that's assigned at birth. That can also help us with risk stratification for the measures that, that, that we've discussed on the prior two slides. Um, I wanna acknowledge that this current history tab is, not, is inadequate as currently constructed. As you can see in this example, all it helps us understand is whether this patient's partners are male or female, but it doesn't let us know uh, how many partners. So it's not a direct tool for understanding high-risk behavior. Uh, It's only part of the way there. Uh, But we wanted to use this space to create a bit of discussion on how how our providers would feel about using structured data to document these sex practices uh, versus pros and, and maybe how we can improve the utility of Epic, you know, helping us make some of these decisions or or prompting us to uh, to increase our frequency. Uh, one other topic that, that we've thought about in this regard is also utilizing MAs and our intake process for understanding a high risk sexual behavior. But I'd like to open up the floor for anybody who's got any comments or thoughts about how they currently document sex practice and and if they have any insights on how maybe it would be um, helpful or not to to use the structured data in Epic. Hi again. <laughs> uh, so do people, um, so first of all, the SOGI is something that if in Epic, if you click on um, the gender, it will open up the SOGI, um, which is where um, that's the bottom picture there. It's a little bit small, but um you know, that information about, um, I can't really see it very well, Um, their sexual orientation and then their gender identity questions are there. Um, So that's something that um, I think is being used more and more during registration or when a patient um, checks in themselves in the kiosk, they can fill out that information themselves directly. And then how many of you use in the history tab? How many of you um, use the um, under history? There's, um, you know, substance and sexual behaviors. Do any of you, I use it very consistently. Um, do others do that? Use that section? I, I, I see that Dr. Hano has the. Um, I think that's residual. Matthew, did you? Matthew, 
<laughs> yeah, sorry, have... that's that's residual. Let me um, try and figure out how to take it down on my that's phone. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. What, what are your thoughts about this sort of structured data? I'm going to call on you. Thank you for your participation in this <laughs> in this presentation. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I I have to say that I free free write it, you which do. probably okay. which is probably not uh, very efficient, and you know it means that it gets forgotten. Um, um, from time from time to time so um yeah i i would really welcome any suggestions that um could, would improve how consistently i record uh, sexual history of i think you know often and you know this is an excuse and not a very valid one but i'll have a conversation and um around sort of sexual health and well-being and not not document you know in the detail um that i've in the same detail um that i've had um in the discussion um so mm -hmm. Ch choice can you say again what you, in the, is there a, which bit of the history um do do you do you use so um if you in it's in the rooming tab so when you're right. when you have a visit and you know when you click on rooming yeah if you click on history there is um you know, questions about smoking, right, um, right, right. questions about alcohol, questions about sex behavior and drug use. And um, as Erville mentioned, like if you look at the sexual history section, it's, I think it's outdated. Like some of the language um, is not great and it's not fully, um, you know, capturing everything. Um, but again, we can't, we, we, with sex behavior, we really can't define that denominator, right? Who are the people that we should be screening um, more consistently for STI? Um, you know, outside of HIV positive people, if they're HIV negative, who should be offered PrEP, you know, these these kinds of things as DoxyPep, you know, we um, have DoxyPep as, as an option for prevention. So this is, you know, by using structured data, that's where population health interventions happen, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, there's, there's, there are cues for us as providers when we're seeing the patient, like, oh yeah, you know, they're due for their quadrivalent meningitis vaccine. Oh yeah, they're due for um, mammogram. Oh yeah, they're due for colon cancer screening, right? But also, so that's helpful. I find it helpful. Then there's also like on a systems level, right? Like if you if you can pull a report of people who could benefit from an intervention, then you can then implement some workflows outside of that direct patient interaction. Um, some things are more straightforward. So those are the things, um, Erville and Luis, we kind of listed things that we felt like were more straightforward um, and, and there's less nuance and we wanna send that back for feedback. But then these are the things where it's a little bit less straightforward um that we're reviewing and then if we want to if we want to be able to better target interventions for people um who are at risk for STIs then we we would need for this kind of a tool we would need to have a place again this sort of structured data that then we know that that person belongs in the denominator for that um screening test and then that's going to show up as a gap. And again, and then we could potentially pull a report. And then there's something that, you know, other other folks could do um, as an intervention for that for that group. Yeah, thanks, Joyce. I, I'm going to start using that um, more consistently. I think that's a, a, a great um, reminder. And of course, um, I take on board everything that you say about, you know, if we can't measure it, we can't. Um, we, we sometimes we can't see the edges of the problem and conceptualize a, a solution. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that reminder. Um, the experience that I've had, and I know that it, it doesn't tra always translate, is that if you allow people to 
complete the data themselves, um, you know, in a private place, um, you know, either inter interfacing with a screen or pen and paper, then I think that a lot of our assumptions as providers are really challenged when people are, um, when people tell us what they, um, you don't even have to really go into detail. You can just say, would you like an anal swab, a throat swab, a, uh, you know, a vaginal swab or a urine test? I think those um, people figure it out for themselves. So, and there's a lot of things that we ask, and I completely agree with Siobhan and Kelly's comments that we don't want to ask these questions in a in a public place. But if we can, if we can think of a way or help to think of a way where we can empower our patients to answer these in advance, um, so that they come, so you can have a focused discussion, that would be really helpful. Yeah, I think it, maybe a potential way could be the my chart uh, check in information when people are checking in for their appointments that will require more uh, literacy in terms of uh, technology, but if the, for the people that we can uh, get through this uh, setting, I don't, we'll, we'll discuss that. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And thanks, Kelly and Siobhan. Yeah, thank you so much for, for, for that discussion. Uh, we just have uh, one more specific uh, slide for care gaps in particular, and then and then we'll be able to wrap up. So Luis, if you want to move on to our next uh, our next slide. Uh, and then this is going to be for our HIV specific uh, labs, so CD4 count and uh, viral load. So taking a look at the uh, IDSA guidelines, I won't go through uh, in and belabor the, the, the guideline recommendation that, that, that's written on the screen. Um, we wanted to have a care gap that was bare bones and simple, um, given that there is a lot of nuance with when to order CD4 and viral loads, depending on the patient that's in front of you and what's going on in their life. Um, and so our very kind of simplified metric is a CD4 count every six months for all patients who are in the Bartlett Clinic uh, living with HIV. And if their last CD4 count was under 300, than a uh, than <clears throat> a care gap that, that shows up for every three months. And then for viral load, um, if their viral load is over, uh, if their last viral load is over 50, uh, then every three month check of their viral load. And then if their viral load is under 50 for two years, uh, which is the cutoff that is recommended by, uh, by IDSA because of uh, preventing uh, low-level viremia and, and the association of low-level viremia with um, some possible worse outcomes. Uh, that, that's kind of the, um, the cutoff that we had talked about. If, they're, if they have a viral load that's less than 50 for two years, then we could space out viral load testing for Q6 uh, months. Now, we also wanted to hear feedback on, on how this proposed um, care gap would be received. This is Sarah again. I'll just comment kind of to what, not just specifically, but in general, what you were getting at as far as starting these care gaps while trying to figure out the nuances of how to code everything exactly perfectly. And I think when I've seen care gaps that have been a little glitchy, like I have some people who with HIV where the like HIV screening care gap comes up and I cannot for the life of me figure out how to get it to go away. And then, and then when that happens with just one care gap, I'm like, I'm not even going to look at these because they're no longer helpful for me. So I feel like in the meantime, while trying to come up with a way that they'll work really well, is is it possible to have, these are really helpful, like these tables are very helpful to be able to like see HIV related, you know, healthcare maintenance recommendations and like hover over them to just have like a way to check and, and remind us to think about some of these topics. So I think that would be really helpful um, in the in the near term. Yeah, I think we um, we can discuss with the EPIC team if that's a tool that is possible uh, to be implemented. Um, but yeah, I appreciate that that feedback. 
I mean, one thing that we can definitely do is um, put this in the um, Bartlett intranet. So that is bookmarked um, in all of the rooms. I'll add, I'm gonna add the um, international, um, uh, the, those new anal cancer screening guidelines. I'll add that to the internet. And then thank you, um, Luis and Reveal for your hard work on this. This is, I agree with Sarah. This was a, a big project to tackle just given all of the different, um, different uh, gaps and like thinking about what would be actionable and implementable in um, in Epic. So I think we have one minute left. Why don't you guys maybe wrap it up? Sorry. Yeah. Luis, you want to take us home? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, the next steps, we, we we already have discussed some of the uh, feedback for the providers, and we also wanted to uh, uh, provide a provider survey that we will be sending out uh, to get your feedback um, and uh, as conclusions of this presentation, we have uh, uh, this probably will represent an evidence-based tool to improve the HIV care continuum. And this tool could potentially improve the uh, care of people living with HIV in the primary care setting. And we need uh, also comparison with the standard of care for their head in this project. Uh, we also wanted to thank, uh, thank Dr. Todd Brown uh, for his feedback and Anna Durbin, uh, who has also been uh, helpful to this uh, project. And we welcome any feedback at any time. If you didn't want to give it in this forum, please email us. Uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Luis and Erviel. Um, you know, really wonderful job, um, both with the work and then and then with this presentation. Um, all right. Hope everybody has a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you.